Graham Parker, welcome to the show. Uh, how are you? Where, where in the world are you? Uh, we're so happy to be here. We are actually uh, visiting our parents in the house we grew up in Laguna Beach. So we've tried to make it look cool with our, you know, Rumble Through the Dark logo behind us. But also, if you look, you know, on my side, I also have all the children's books we were read when we were a child. So, you know, um, yeah, full disclosure, we are at our parents' house. <laughs> Uh, have you have you been asked whether you want those books kept or have they voluntarily your parents voluntarily kept them because I got a call from my mum going look do you want these because I want to throw them out and I'm like keep them keep them I might want to read them one day for nostalgia oh no they are they are kept they are kept and we are told these are kept for when you all have kids these are here for you just like we have you know baby clothes and rattlers just like you know we have my mom builds bunk beds in places where we don't need bunk beds. The only people who sit there are 35 year old friends, but apparently <laughs> they are for our children in the future. Yeah. We're getting the message loud and clear. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. I love that. That's sort of those, those ever so not subtle hints. Um, listen, let's, let's, let's talk about your absolutely incredible new movie rumble through the dark. So it's beautiful. It's brutal. Um, for, for those who don't know, give, give us a brief lowdown on what Rumble Through the Dark is about. Sure, yeah. It's following uh, this character, Jack Boucher, who's a bare-knuckle fighter at the end of a long career in the cage. Um, he's, he really has no business fighting anymore. Um, he's, you know, he's over the hill in, in fighting terms, as I'm sure you can imagine. He's you know, in his 50s, and he's fighting to get out from under uh, the weight of this debt that he owes to this character, Big Mama Sweet, who's sort of the queen of the Mississippi Delta vice, kind of like the godfather, like the female black godfather of the, of the South. And, um, and he's doing all of this really so he can save his childhood home that he grew up in. So I guess it's appropriate that we're, <laughs> that we're here. Um, very good. Very he, good. Clever. Clever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're, we're yeah, we're storytellers. We know what we're doing, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So his his foster mother, who brought him in when he was young and hard to handle, and really gave him the first touch of what unconditional love can can do to someone. Um, he's trying to repay that favor after decades of addictions and gambling and um, and fighting, um, and now he's trying to he's trying to redeem himself and um and she's dying of dementia so he's trying to he has a ticking clock so he's trying to do it before it's too late and it's obviously based on the the 2018 novel the fighter by michael farris smith um who also wrote the film uh, wrote the screenplay for the movie and to take you back to the novel what was your first reaction to reading the novel and what it was about that novel that jumped out at you and made you go actually this is a film we'd like to make yeah, I, you know, Graham and I knew we wanted to explore that kind of Southern Gothic world. We grew up reading Faulkner and Cormac McCarthy. We'd always been drawn to it. Um, and then there was another side of us that, you know, uh, loved Taxi Driver. We loved that kind of, you know, very isolated protagonist, that singular through line. You know, Joker came out, kind of revisited that again. And, you know, for my brother and I hadn't had having made, you know, one film, we really wanted this next one to really be focused on one character that could really, you know, propel it. And so, you know, we just started reading. And then, you know, one day we picked up The Fighter. And I think I started reading it first, but I was about halfway through and I called Graham and I, you know, I said I found it. But, you know, of course, in, in this world, it's like you can read something, you could find it, but there's so many obstacles. One, can you even get in touch with the author? Two, does he have a desire to make this into a movie? So, so many authors are, you know, uh, against that because they've seen their work destroyed. And so they really want, you know, to just keep it as is. And then, you know, is the option even available to be, to make it into a film? You know, so much is, so much of this IP is bought up immediately. So, you know, we, we, we crossed our fingers, we sent an email to Michael and, uh, yeah, I guess we said the right things because we were on a flight to Mississippi a couple of days later, having drinks with them at a bar and we sealed the deal. And he, uh, he said he really wanted to write it, which, you know, uh, is not always common. And you kind of worry that, you know, if, if the novelist is adapting his own work, will he be too precious about it? And, and Michael, you know, is not that way at all. He, he's, he's an incredible screenwriter. He can write, you know, his own original screenplays, but he also can adapt his work uh, uh, extremely well. And he was very collaborative. You know, we were telling him kind of how we saw it. And then he was incorporating that, you know, into his vision as well, which was great. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it must be a very, very nice thing to have the author on board because, I mean, you only have to look at any Alan Moore adaptation. And I think no matter how good it is, I mean, Zack Snyder must have been like, this Watchman is there is no way he he can, he doesn't like it. There you go. OK, so fair enough. Uh, but, yeah, having Michael on board must have been really good. And I'm assuming you definitely said the right thing and you have a great working relationship with him because I, I, looking at your upcoming projects, am I right in thinking you're making your next two movies with him? Yeah, we, <laughs> we either really like working with him or we're beginning to be lazy writers because uh, there was a time. <laughs> There was a time Graham and I were writing together, but honestly, it's, you know, it, it's kind of what we have just having two of us because, you know, we always have, you know, some fresh perspective battling the new idea. And with Michael, there's just, you know, Graham and I have such a shared upbringing. It's great to have that other person to kind of feed off of and inspire. And, you know, I think um, some famous director said things are good in threes. I think it was Kurosawa said, yeah. you know, you always want three people. Um, you know, because it can it can break a tie, which you know is helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, you've already mentioned um, where you visited Michael and, and where the movie set, Mississippi. I think one of the things for me, which I love about any film, um, and yours does it in Spades, is transport you completely, transport you and immerse you in a entirely different location. In this case, Mississippi. I mean, at points it felt like the screen, my TV screen, was sweating because of the, the heat coming off it. How important was it for you to actually shoot on location in Mississippi? And what were the best and worst things of actually doing it on the ground in that state? Well, I think our answer changed once we actually went to Mississippi because we were there um, about a year, about a year, year and a half before we actually started shooting because it took a while for us to get the financing together and everything. And a lot of the shots in the movie were actually shots that we got on our first scout when we were just cruising around with Michael Ferris Smith and his truck, you know, from whatever newest drone DJ I had at the time, which I'm sure is totally obsolete now. Like we were just <laughs> going around and just getting a feel for the space. But um, it, it became incredibly important because the landscape, you know, kind of like what you're talking about, it's a, it's a character in the movie. And I think that's why we were drawn to Southern Gothic lit for so long. And, you know, why we love Tennessee Williams, where the heat is so important and, you know, so many of his plays and in his films and, um, you know, Faulkner and Cormac McCarthy and No Country for Old Men is one of our favorite films. And, you know, the landscape really plays uh, a role. It, it's sort of the, um, you know, in some ways it's, it just, it holds this, uh, it holds this history and this weight, um, you know, and it's got a lot of dark history in those parts and um, a lot of rage and a lot of, uh, and a lot of oppression and, and joy and it's a, a sort of place of paradox and um i think that we just really love how in that world the psychology of a certain character can sort of play itself out in in the landscape and uh when we were talking to aaron early on he's like you know we got to film this in the summer when it's actually as hot as it is in the book and we're like we're like part of us you know like do we really need we we we, 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 we were just there it's pretty miserable but we got it we actually loved that he that's how he felt about it because it changes the nature of the performances you know it slows people down they have to be more judicious about how they spend their energy you know there's something almost animalistic about it when it gets that hot which is it's cool we saw it in mudbound too and we really liked it there uh, uh, the uh, the Aaron you're talking about, Aaron Eckhart. Um, what what a what a performance! I mean, he's just becoming a, a chameleon like actor. This is this is a performance like I've not seen him give before. He's he's brilliant in this. What what did it mean to you to get him for the role? What did he bring to this role of Jack? Yeah, we um, you know it was it, it's funny. I think Graham and I often develop a project with an actor in mind. And with this one, having read the novel first, it, it, we didn't really have a face in our imagination yet. So when we were ready to go out with the script, you know, we do, you know, what you normally do. We get our list of our, you know, top guys. And it was just, it was hard for us to come up with that list. And we were, I remember we were driving around LA one day and we got a call from Cassie and Ellis, our producer. And he said, what about Aaron Eckhart? And my brother's face just totally lit up. And, uh, and he's like, that's the one. And I think that, you know, yeah, you said, Alex, you haven't seen him do anything like this. And I think Graham and I are always attracted to actors 
who we really respect and we really admire their body of work, but also we can give them something that they haven't done because, you know, at the end of the day, you know, Graham and I are not a lot of people know who we are. So we're trying to figure out, hey, you know, how can we, if you're going to trust us, we're going to trust you. And for us, it's really, it's really exciting to give someone a role where they have an opportunity to, you know, jump into something unknown and a little dangerous. Um, because I think, I think Hollywood tends to, you know, pigeonhole people. And I think, you know, uh, that could be frustrating for any creative. I used the word brutal at the start because one of the key elements of this film are obviously the fights um, and especially that climactic fight between Aaron Eckhart, Jack, and an absolutely <laughs> massive Derek Russo. Uh, tell me a little bit about whether you gave yourselves a mission statement in terms of what you wanted to achieve with that final fight? You know, we, we it took us a while to really circle what we wanted to, um, how we wanted the fight style to be. Because on the one hand, Jack is homegrown. You know, a lot of the, a lot of where mixed martial arts came from is it wasn't, it wasn't a very calculated curriculum that got these fighters to that place. They're just like, well, that works better from over there. Like I saw that guy do that one thing that kicked my ass that one time. Like I'm going to steal that, you know, I'm never doing that again. So like that part of Taekwondo is out. Like when I get on the floor, I'm going to use this. So it's got this sort of, it, it has this kind of homegrown, like grassroots feel, particularly for, you know, when you're reading the, the novel, uh, which is wonderful if anyone gets the chance to read it. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's such a cinematic book. And I think that's why we were so attracted to it. But it talks about some of the internal um, processes where Jack sort of found his fighting style. And it came from him reading a lot of books and just making mistakes. And um, and so he wanted it to feel very, uh, very distinct and very real. We wanted it to be effective. Um, there's a reason why he's called uh, The Butcher. Um, because we wanted him to have a lot of slicing and dicing and like that sort of technicality to it, almost like he sort of found Krav Maga before before it was cool. Um, <laughs> and uh, you know, he had this capacity to take down people who were a lot bigger than him. Um, we really loved this David and Goliath, um, you know, tactician over overwhelming odds and brute strength uh, dynamic. Um, both because that's what he's dealing with psychologically, and also because. There's a part of us that that loves like you know the kind of um, the, you know there's the something underdog, about like the the, the, the brawling thing of the yeah. 80s. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I, that in there. <laughs> you're gonna have to. I'm a layman when it comes to fighting. Uh, I, I I I've somehow managed to never have a fight in in my life. Like, how do you even go about researching? Like those kind of fights, that environment, this illegal bare knuckle boxing match with illegal gambling going on around it. Is there a reference point? Is, is that something that exists or was that just a blank canvas for you to paint your own ideas of what that environment might be like? Into We didn't know if it existed, honestly. Um, and, and it does. <laughs> it's just wow. crazy. Once you start talking to MMA fighters, um, they actually all know that it exists. And that's how most of them actually got started, crazy yeah. enough. Um, so once you talk to them, you can start going to some of these fights. And we went to a couple, and uh, I actually went to one that was in Thailand. There was like a Muay Thai fight. It's a lot more common there, and it's more advertised. Um, you know, and it's just, it's like, it's gladiatorial. It's nuts, you know? It's, uh, and, and there's a level of presence and that you just don't get in day-to-day -day life you know you'll be on the subway and you'll see a lot of people and they're just you know they're dead asleep and you go to one of these and it's like people are alive you know and yeah it comes with a whole slew of of bizarre other aspects of humanity coming out as well but you know at the end of the day the fighters who are in the ring they're coming to terms with their fear their doubts their their shame their rage and there was something really cool about these people you know really poignant about these people sort of overcoming all of that and um 
so that was important. We also just started following all of these like underground Instagram pages with all these crazy fights and just saving every single little little thing that we that we liked and then sending it on to our incredible stunt choreographers. It's I, I it's I mean I, I it's 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 so crazy that that exists. I kind of had an inkling it might. Um, I think my brain, and I do mean this as a, as a huge compliment because I love this movie, but my brain started to go, maybe it doesn't exist because this is too much like the Thunderdome in Mad Max with <laughs> Big Mama Sweet uh, played brilliantly uh, by um, Marion Jean-Baptiste, uh, like in the Tina Turner auntie role, lording it over these fighters. I was like, oh, this is... This is almost, it, it sort of errs on the side of science fiction, but to hear it exist is crazy. Yeah, I think, I think Graham and I are always attracted to stories that, you know, could be, uh, you know, could be relics of the past. I mean, stories that, although they exist in today's society, you, you almost could, you know, have shot the exact same story a hundred years ago. And I think, you know, when we read this novel, you know, the, the setup is so unique. And by the time you enter, you finally get to see what Big Mama's ring looks like. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's, there's, you can compare it to the Coliseum and Gladiator, you know, it's, it's a stage where the crowd controls, you know, and at the end of the day, there's one person who's going to put their thumb up or their thumb down. And um, yeah, there was just something really unique. And with that, you know, the ability to, although it does exist, you know, we get to also create our own take on that, you know, um, inspired by Michael's words. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a fun place to be. You're not having to, the target is not, you know, we get to set the target and try and hit it, which is, which is great. Uh, let's talk about your working relationship as we're about to go on a journey with the two of you together. Do you apportion off certain elements of directing? Because obviously you're joint directors on the film. Does one of you prefer working with actors? Does one of you prefer shooting action? Or is it very much uh, a collaboration on every particular scene that you do? Yeah, um, yeah, I think, you know, I think we both can wear each other's hats at the end of the day, but there, we definitely have kind of preferences. Um, my brother is, uh, you know, much far more technical than I, you know, if it was just me, I wouldn't have been, been able to log on to speak with you this morning. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, so he's, you know, you'll often see if you came onto one of our set, you're probably going to see my brother hanging out with camera department. My brother's going to, or he's going to be on the grip truck, or he's going to be, you know, hanging with the production designer and he's going to be placing stuff on the set and, you know, talking with our, you know, set deck. Um, whereas I'm, you're probably going to see me hanging around camera, you know, video village, you know, I'm usually the one inviting the actors to set, you know, laying out the blocking that Graham and I have discussed, you know, weeks before. And yeah. And then if something, you know, we'll kind of, you know, tap each other out sometimes and switch, you know, if someone else sees something else and our, and our shorthand's really good, you know, we can have a very intense argument on set or conversation and no one really knows what it is. Cause we're kind of like smiling and like talking through, you know, gritted teeth, almost like we've trained as <laughs> like, you know, uh, whatever you put up with the talking of things. Ventriloquists. Ventrilo yeah, we kind of, we're, we're kind of have the ventriloquist thing, you know, where we can oh, speak yeah. without our lips moving. So uh, <laughs> everything seems calm, you know, which is important. Still see us as puppets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, let's see how calm this journey is. Graham Parker, it's now time to leave this reality and enter another dimension, a dimension of pure film where our virtual cinema awaits. You are our guide. We are your audience. Let's go on a trip to the movies. So we push open the doors to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer. There's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema foyer, the hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, guys. Who have you picked, living or dead, to go with you? Graham, I'll start with you. Hmm. You know, I think I'm going to revive Philip Seymour Hoffman because he's one of my favorite artists, uh, living or dead. And I've always wanted to... I've always wanted to meet him and pick his brain. Wow. What an incredible actor. Um, an actor, I think, who could seemingly straddle both highbrow, let's call it, movies and huge summer blockbusters, everything from The Master to Twister or The Hunger Games or uh, Mission Impossible 3. Do you have a movie that first introduced you to him or a favorite movie of his? I think what introduced me to him was was Mission Impossible, but uh, but the master um, 
for me is is what takes the cake. It's so good. Mich- yeah, I mean, the master's in- in- incredible. It's uh, I think it's one of the most difficult lists to um to try and create is ranking um uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's movies because it's like that. The top three for me are constantly changing. Do you do you have a, a is it the master? Um, it's uh, the master is always like my second or third thought because there's other movies that I think are more exciting in the traditional sense. Um, but it's always it always is like it's always number two or number three, and the others tend to fall off the list. So there's something about it that's just it goes to show that good solid filmmaking just it takes it takes the win over the little exciting tricks uh you know for me i mean it's just his shot making is unparalleled and i think that that, that one shot looking down at walking phoenix at the you know with all the soldiers throwing up the crap trying to wake him up i mean that's that's got to be one of the greatest shots in cinema <laughs> And of course, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who you are taking to this cinema, is in Boogie Nights as well. And I always remember in Boogie Nights, he's got such minimal screen time. And yet you feel so much for his journey and the journey. That character is one of the characters you feel the most empathy for, I think, in that film. Same, same with Big Lebowski. I mean, the, I don't know. These supporting characters he plays just completely like bolster everyone around him. He's yeah, he's he's just been such a chameleon and like such an inspiration for me as an actor. Cause I think that, you know, like Parker was saying, Hollywood can, it can try to pigeonhole you. And you know, if, if you just refuse to be pigeonholed, you won't be, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's quite funny that you mentioned uh, Mission Impossible three is your introduction to him. I, I, I argue this all the time that hands down, he is still the best villain in any of the Mission Impossible movies. He's absolutely terrifying in that film. Yeah, his capacity to both have, you know, wear his heart on his sleeve in certain roles, but also do the whole dead eyes thing out of nowhere. Like that's, it's just, it's scary, you know? (laughs) So we've got Philip Seymour Hoffman as one guest. Parker, over to you. Who is joining you as second guest at the cinema? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about it while Graham was talking. It's tough. Um, I think... I think I'd pick Richard Harris, um, both because, you know, I'm in awe of his work. Uh, one of the movies I fell in love with as a kid was Camelot. Um, and I think he'd, I think he'd also be a great hang. Uh, and that's important for who I bring to the movies. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, cause obviously for an entire generation, he's the original Dumbledore uh, from Harry right. Potter, but uh, there's a great book I read called Hellraisers, uh, which focuses in on, uh, Richard Harris, Peter O'Toole, and uh, Oliver Reed, and the antics yeah. they got up to in their prime. So I imagine he'd have some stories. No, I was going to say if I could, if I could bring more, then that would be I'd bring them and probably Richard Burton, <laughs> and the theater would probably burn down. But um, <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, the uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I would have loved to have hang, hung with him for a night. Uh, here's a here's a Richard Harris curveball. He's the one reason that I have seen the film Orca Killer Whale more than once. Um, I don't know if you've ever experienced Orca Killer Whale. It's Jaws, but with a killer whale. No, no, and I didn't. I didn't know our uh, viewing tonight, so uh, we'll watch that. And hopefully, our next film is somehow inspired. I think the budget for a whale is a lot, though. So, <laughs> yeah, he, uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's basically if you imagine Quint. Uh, already a 10 he's a 12 he's quint dialed up to a 12 it's it's incredible i don't know that you could call it his best performance but it's definitely worth seeking out okay okay we'll take your word for it we'll check it out (laughs) all right there is a clock on the wall in the foyer it reads a specific time what time of day are we going to the cinema parker yeah i mean i mean no knowing that i'm with you know richard and hopefully a couple of his pals he's drug in i think we're gonna have to go after you know cocktail hour hopefully we met at a pub and now we're you know hustling into the theater to uh, catch the last trailer before the movie starts uh, so you you're, you're going after drinks uh i i love it uh, 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 uh graham uh what are you what are you thinking are you happy about this because it sounds like this may be quite a rowdy screening <laughs> <laughs> yeah no i guess i guess that'll I guess it's a good idea. You know, I was thinking, 
I was thinking it'd be, I always like it when I leave a theater and um, I think it's cool when there's still some light out. So um, I'm kind of, I'm waffling on my answer. I'd, I'd actually like to drag it up a little bit earlier, but I guess with the drinkers, it makes sense. Also, I'm thinking that what I want to see is Killers of the Flower Moon. So in order to go to that and still have light out, I probably need to go at like, what, noon? So, you know, maybe I just call it all off. We do post cocktail <laughs> hour. I can see that. <laughs> Yeah, there's the, I was reading about some articles. It's already happening. People are starting to go, with Killers of the Flower Moon at three hours plus, should we bring back the theater intermission? Do, do you think we need to start having intermissions if movies are going to be this long? You know, Parker and I were just talking about that, you know. Uh, as a principal, we both kind of are circling that, and you know, we're not the first people to bring this up, that you probably should be able to get through a movie if you're like a normal bladdered person without having to leave and miss parts of the film because otherwise you put the filmmaker in a weird position where you're going okay so the audience is going to miss something around probably like the midpoint of your film you know are you cool with that and i don't know yeah i see it's tough because it's like and nolan i think came out with oppenheimer coming out and he said it's okay to use the bathroom during my movie which i was actually surprised he said that was actually cool he said but you know, I, I took my girlfriend to Oppenheimer and she, you know, she missed the explosion. So it's like, you know, you don't, <laughs> you don't have time, right? the whole thing was like four minutes. <laughs> oh, uh, right. Well, either way, it sounds like we're going in an evening. So that's a busy screening. Uh, the communal experience is, I'm sure, something that you enjoy. Have you had chance to watch Rumble Through the Dark with an audience yet in a full auditorium? No, we are actually doing a screening next week, and uh, yeah, I'm. I, we're very much looking forward to it. My brother, for that, will probably be sitting back row, and it's just, you know, if you've ever been in something where you're, you know, screening something for the first time, you're hyper aware of everyone's little twitches and quirks, and, you know, if someone sighs in the first front row, you're like, why'd that guy sigh? You know, and then you're <laughs> thinking, so you kind of have to, you know, we've, I've gotten better at it. Graham's far better than I am, but you know it's an interesting experience being at. It's a miserable experience being in the theater with for the first time with all you know. Thankfully, we got a really warm crowd. It's all our friends, yeah. you know. But but yeah, it's tough. I mean, it's you know because you've spent you've spent you know years doing this thing, but everyone else in there, they're just like, yeah, I got the invite. I'm coming here for a little under two hours, you know, and and it's just. It, and you know, like the the anguish and the and the, the the joys and the pitfalls of every little micro decision, and you know, should we have kept that the extra thirty seconds in that scene? Should we just stayed in that shot and made him sit with it? You know, or like, no, no I, was that hospital beat too loud? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's kind of you know, and we have watched it with folks, you know, when we were in the edits. Of course, you invite people to see the film because you're trying to figure out how to shape it best. And that's an interesting process because in that process, you know, Alex, if we were like, hey, Alex, we want you to see if you could screen the film for us. It's almost like we, we would just watch you watch it. And before you could even open your mouth for comments, we'd be like, I know, I know. Like we'd already know almost. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, then. So we're going in the evening after drinks. Now, you have booked the tickets for this trip. Thank you very much. Where are we going to be sitting in the auditorium, Graham? Well, since it's IMAX, I think we're going to probably do, you know how there's like that first tier and then there's the, then there's the big jump up and then the, the fourth row a lot of times starts and it's way higher. I, I think fifth row where my head is just below center of the screen, dead center, because if you're on the side in an IMAX, like everything is so warped and, you know, but I also, I have a problem because I, I wear progressive lenses. So I probably got to put my contacts on because what happened when I, when I watched Oppenheimer, is everything at the bottom of the screen was like it was enlarged, and everything at the top of the screen was smaller. Um, so, yeah. oh my god, never, learner. never tell Christopher Nolan that. That is the kind of thing that would make him pass out. He's like, he's like, you must see this in IMAX. See it on the biggest screen possible. He didn't ha at no point. He he probably is kicking himself. And if you are wearing progressive lenses. Take them off and put context in. That's the way to enjoy Oppenheimer. Right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we're putting you in the middle of the middle, Parker. Do you want the middle of the middle as well? Or do you want to separate I, I yourself? Me and my crowd. 
we just have to kind of stay as far back as possible. So Graham and, you know, Philip have, you know, great conversations during the film and they're not disturbed by us. So we're going to respect their space a little bit. Right. I'm putting you a safe distance and I'll inhabit a kind of buffer zone between the two groups just so it all stays friendly. The last thing we need before we leave the foyer and start our walk down towards the auditorium. Oh, the air is full of wonderful smells. All manners of snacks and foodstuffs are available at the various counters. What are you choosing to eat, Parker? Um... <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I was gonna say I was I don't know I was gonna say popcorn and then I feel like again I feel like that can be thrown and stuff so maybe just like milk duds which I guess also could be yeah I don't know milk duds and popcorn I kind of like milk duds and shaking them up with the popcorn um you know it's kind of it's 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 it's, it's, it's as close as you can get to like a three star Michelin inside a theater. <laughs> yeah, I think as far as projectiles go, a milk dud is a, is a slightly denser. Projectile. Yeah. I think that's a that's a better so that's, that's in front of of this rowdy crowd. I'm not feeling this milk dud ammunition. <laughs> okay, light light and fluffy popcorn, no butter. Oh no, no, that's interesting because when I've had American guests on the show before, that everyone raves about the butter. We don't get it in the UK, and I, I realize we're calling it butter, and we're all fully aware it's, it, it it bears no resemblance to actual butter. Yeah, but no, you say it's no. Like the opposite of, I can't believe it's not butter. Everyone can believe it's not butter. It tastes nothing like butter, and it is so good. <laughs> yeah, well, but I you say no butter. to butter, Parker. Yeah, well, I mean, we're you know we're we're not complete animals. We're wa we're watching our figure a little bit. Good. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Right, popcorn, no butter. Anything to drink, Parker? Um, you know, probably just a large Coke with a bunch of straws. What's Large in the flasks? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you like Large, to know? <laughs> Large, I'm going to write down Large Coke and secret flasks. Uh, best not to ask what's in the flask. Uh, Graham, what are you having to eat, first of all? Whatever gets thrown my way. <laughs> <laughs> Great I, stuff. I do like... There you, you go. do like what? Go up. No, you can. I, you're allowed your own food. I just hate. I, I think it'll become distracting if you start to try and catch them in your mouth by swiveling around every time you hear a milk dud whistling through the air. Yeah, that's a good point. Gosh, I do love. I, did you start the milk duds in the popcorn thing? I thought that I started that. I mean, I don't start. All, it, but... all great ideas have come from older brother. And then they get trickled down, <laughs> and including milk duds yeah. and popcorn. Yeah, it's it's comments like that 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 made Cain kill Abel. <laughs> or, which, or which one? <laughs> oh, is this is this the beginning of the fight? We, I, I'll just clarify. We did, we tried to do this interview at an earlier time. Wi-Fi wasn't great, and you said let's do it another time when we're in the same room because there may be an actual fight. It feels like this milk duds could be the unlikely culprit that begins the fight. It, it, it is. I think we're, we're going to really try and make it through a couple more questions between, before the fists come out, because our fight is not nearly as, uh, as brutal or cinematic as the fight in Rumble Through the Dark. It's more of a slapping match. <laughs> right. Uh, let, let's, see, let's see how far we get. So uh, milk duds in popcorn is what you're going for, Graham. And uh, do you want a drink with that? With that? I'll, t I'll take a Dr. Pepper. That sounds good. Nice. Dr. But, Pepper. But you know what? If, if Philip Seymour Hoffman's having a cocktail, or he's getting, you know, he's having a Peroni or something like that. Like, you know, I don't want him to feel weird. Great. I like that. You're a, you're a, uh, a considerate drinker. You will drink with someone if they're drinking so they don't feel like, oh, I thought we were I'm both a having a drink. drinker. Yes, that's, that's, that's true. <laughs> Empathetic. There's nothing, worse where, where, no, there's nothing worse when you have a lunch meeting and they, the waiter comes to you first and you go, oh, oh, yeah, sure, I'll have a beer. And then the person you're having the meeting with goes, just a sparkling water for me. And you're like, God damn it, I've, I've misjudged this, misjudged this. Now I'm going to be <laughs> self-conscious about drinking and they won't drink. Oh, it's awful. awful I've already business. chosen the wrong road. Yeah, you just got to treat every one of those, those lunch meetings like the, the McConaughey, the Caprio meeting and Wolf of Wall Street. You just got to assume. <laughs> You know, and then you order you order the beer for the other person, <laughs> and it'll take yeah. one more every hour until someone passes out. <laughs> I love it. 
Right, let's leave this foyer. We push open the doors to the corridor towards the auditorium. Now, the corridor's looking a little bare right now, so I'm going to decorate it with posters that depict some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster depicts your fondest movie memory. Who'd like to tell me their fondest movie memory first? Um, probably my favorite movie memory was seeing Braveheart with my brother. Uh, for the first time. By the time I saw it, he'd seen it like six or seven times. And so I really got like something close to the director's commentary. Every time that there was a speech, Parker would just break out into full like Scottish brogue and like, just do it verbatim with the actual. You'd go to the screen and face me. And I don't know how old you were, like nine or 10 or something like that. And he, he would just, he gave the whole, every speech full on. It was great. This oh, is, I love it. So, and this finish. is, by the way, he's 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 like six years old watching me impersonate William Wallace. So you know. <laughs> so this is this is 1995's Braveheart. Mel Gibson directed, starring. So you were six years old when you saw it because I seem to remember there was a that like the initial cut of that movie was really really bloody, and I think it was an NC-17, and so they had to really pull back on the violence of those battle scenes to get the R rated, but you're watching it at six. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I was going to say that I, I, I mean, cause that's, that's my fondest movie memory as well. Mine was brave part when my dad took me to it. He took me to it when it came out in at 95, 96. And we were in Texas at the time. And I remember just driving through this thunderstorm because he wanted to come, take me to see this movie. And I remember we sat down and my mom told him, cause she was furious that he was taking me to this. And she said, you better, you know, close his eyes at the, you know, the bad parts. And I remember my dad only put his hand over my eyes one time. And it was during like their marriage scene where there was nudity. All the violence was completely okay. We were all just watching it with our know, jaws open. But, but yeah, that was the only time he yeah. covered my eyes. Yeah. The, yeah. Violence, totally fine. A naked woman. Now that's something you need to be, feel shame or be afraid of. I don't know what's going on. We should unpack that one day. Yeah. Uh -huh. Isn't that funny? I, that's a, I think that's a, that's a thing, isn't it? The MPAA, they're like, they're like violence, no real worries. Sex, uh, like, yeah, I actually, I think maybe I got it wrong. Maybe it was always the other way around. I thought they were, I thought they were happy with violence, but sex was the one thing they used to always cut back on. But I guess in Braveheart, it's uh, it's the other way around. There's supposed to be a longer, a cut. I think Mel Gibson said the original cut was like, uh, like, like over three hours long. Um, and he said he still got it all. And if Paramount ever want to put it together, he'd be happy to assemble that cut. Would you like to see the longer Gibson cut of Braveheart? Uh, absolutely. And I would not be using the restroom during the uh, during the viewing. Yeah. Bring your diapers. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, it's certainly a poster for Braveheart that is going up as your fondest movie memories posters to either side of Braveheart. Your second poster that I'm going to put up depicts your worst movie memory what is your worst movie memory well we're just gonna have a lot of braveheart posters because my worst is also a braveheart memory which was <laughs> which was after the same viewing when i'm six parker's so jazzed up and all jacked up from all the violence that he's he got this stick uh that was like a cane that you know i think my my dad or my mom had brought back from a trip from to africa and it was this big like tribal cane um, and he starts using it like a, you know, a giant long sword and he's just swinging it around the house. And, you know, he comes up to me and he his goes training exercises. Yeah, sure. He's doing his training exercises thinking he's the last samurai. And then when he, he turns to me and he goes, duck. And I, for some reason, I think he says jump. I couldn't really hear him because he's like yelling and he's still got the soundtrack playing because it's a DVD. So he's just, he's just looping the, you know, the main soundtrack titles and, you know, sequence and everything. And I jump. Right as he he swings and he cracks the thing right over my head, I just collapse like a you know like a flan in a cupboard, and he was and, out. Yeah, I was, it was like made from like a you know ancient baobab tree or something. Like the stick was like oh, it made an ungodly sound, and it, I was I mean I heard it in a different way because it was cracking over my own head. My mom comes in, she's like, oh my god, what did you do? And you know, is is much uh, I do what all older brothers say. Oh, he's okay, he's okay, he's okay. He's okay. <laughs> Yeah, you're okay. You're okay. And I was like looking at myself, like, I'm trying to gaslight. I'm like, I don't think I'm okay. So, yeah, another Braveheart poster in the foyer. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, Parker, am, am I right to assume your worst movie memory is accidentally cracking your brother over the head with a really tough piece of wood? No, Alex, I actually took that as a positive. I was kind of, I was worried that my upbringing was not going to make me a good, you know, sword wielder. But when I when I cracked it over his head, I realized that I really had a lot of inner strength. And you uh, also probably I was, realized I had I had the intellectual upper hand. I was cashing up on you, and you needed to send me back a few. Years. Yeah, no, I sent him back years, and I still don't think he's quite recovered. Um, so you know, uh, I still have that over him. And uh, but yeah, I don't know. My worst, I took a date. Um, I remember my first date was in seventh grade and we had been dating for months, but of course we'd never said a word to each other. And I took her to eight mile and, uh, I loved Eminem and she really did not love Eminem and it did not go very well. Um, and uh, that was the end of our illustrious relationship. That was it. That was, it was the, it was the one, one day and out. That was it. She didn't say anything afterwards and she left. I think she was horrified by, um, you know, my taste because I was smiling the entire movie and also knew all the songs, uh, just like I knew all the sword moves in Braveheart. And uh, yeah, I think she's I guess she saw a sign of me she didn't really like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but what a tune. Lose Yourself. What an, what an amazing. I, I think it was the first rap song to win uh, the uh, the best song Oscar. It's a tune. You know, what's funny is uh so so Eckhart he was kind of he was he was trepidatious about taking the role like we heard you know our, our producer Cassian called us and he's like boys we got a yes from Eckhart like it's a go we're doing this thing we're like great Cassian that's awesome we're like let's set up a call we call him and on the call it was really interesting because and this was our first time really dealing with you know uh getting a celebrity attached to a project we were doing we assumed that like once they say yes like it's a yes but that's not so <laughs> it's actually you know, there's a whole like there's a whole thing that starts to happen where it's like, well, not it's really. Dance. It's a, it's it's a dance. You know, you still got the contracts to work out. You still got, you know, you got to figure out a whole bunch of stuff. So Eckhart's like, you know, look, he's, and he's got a lot of other projects. So it's just you're never really certain. So I think there was a, there was a time where we had to, you know, I think something else came up or something happened where all of a sudden Graham and I were like, oh no, is there? Do we have to replace him? Which you know would have killed us but thinking of who possibly could replace him i remember we were like god i wonder if eminem still wants to act i remember we had that conversation and one of the things that parker said was if imagine lose yourself coming on <laughs> when he walks into the you know the cage the thunderdome and i was like would people like i was like that's either one of the greatest ideas i've ever heard or just like <laughs> probably we're totally taking you out of the film kill the damn <laughs> But, you know, he was supposed to be in Southpaw, that uh, film with Gyllenhaal. He was supposed to play the fighter at first, and then he ended up, I think, not being able to do it. So he did all the music to it, and Jake played the role, and he did a great job. But I, I think Eminem's a, I think he's, he's a great actor. I hope he does something again one day. Yeah. Wow. That's... Now, I'm, I'm so pleased I've seen the movie already, because if I was now watching it with the knowledge that I might have heard Lose Yourself and Eminem walking into that cage match at the end, it would, it would take me out of the picture. But wow, <laughs> what, what a thing. Uh, right, let's uh, put up a poster then for Eight Mile on one side and another Braveheart poster on the other. So the third posters were putting up depicts, gentlemen, the last performances that brought you to tears. Oh man, the last performance that brought me to tears. Is this, I don't think you can say my performance with the uh, wooden cane. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I watched Living uh, with Bill Nye, um, oh, yeah. and that I thought that was he was so he was incredible in that. Um, and uh, I was blown away. You know, that's a remake, you know, of the Kurosawa film, and. Um, and yeah, I just thought, you know, which is always kind of dangerous, you know, doing something that was, you know, that was all, you know, many consider a perfect film and then doing another version of it. And I thought they just, yeah, I thought it was perfect. And the way he played his role was just so subtle. And it reminds me of like a quote I heard that Peter O'Toole said one time, and he said, anything you can do, I can do less. And I think, you know, Bill's performance in that is an example of that. It's just, he's not, you know, he, he's so confident and he's so at his peak as an actor. He just knows exactly, you know, how he wants to play it. 
and because of that, you, you lean in as an audience and it's just a really, it's a really emotional um, and personal role. And uh, yeah, actually we were in London this summer. I walked into a bookstore and he was just, I hear this voice and he, I was looking at a book and he goes, is that one good? And I said, I, I don't know, I haven't read it. And I recognized the voice and I looked up and it was him. And he was wearing, he's wearing the suit jacket and the pants and he looked exactly how you would think Bill Nye would look. And he had a, it was raining outside. So he had his umbrella cane. And, and then I watched him go outside. I didn't say anything. So of course you want to say, you know, oh my God, like, you know, you're one of my heroes. But I just, we checked out, he was in front of me and I watched him get out. And I remember he, he was getting into a cab and it was pouring rain. And there was this lady coming up with her child and he saw them coming and he didn't get in the cab and he held the cab for them. He said, would you like to have it? He gave him the cab, closed the door and he went off walking in the rain. And I was like, of course. And he's an amazing person. So, uh, <laughs> Wow, that is amazing. And I I mean, you've done something, though, Bill Nye, he's uh, never done, which is actually watch living. He's never seen living. He doesn't watch his his own performances. He says he hates watching himself on screen. Has um, has Aaron Eckhart watched Rumble in the Dark yet? Have you watched it with him? I don't think, you know, Aaron said something to us on set. He hasn't watched a film uh, since like 2006. I think the last film he said he watched, um, he watched Dark Knight at the premiere because Nolan made him watch it. And then he's, he, he hadn't watched a film for a few years before that. And I, he hasn't seen a film since except for Sully. He said Clint Eastwood made him sit next to him and watch Sully. And I guess when Clint Eastwood tells you to do something, uh, you do it. So, um, but uh, yeah, so I, I don't think he'll watch it, but it's just, you know, and, and I get it, you know, it's so, you know, it's so personal what you put out and it's hard to watch yourself. And, um, you know, as much as Graham and I would love to share that with actors, I think, uh, you know, my, my brother's an actor and I think it's, he could speak to it more than I can, but it, it's tough to, it's tough to see your own performance. Mm. Is that, is that, yeah. would you agree no, with that? I mean, <clears throat> yeah. It's, uh, you know, it's really tough in, um, in, in film because you're, you're giving away a lot of, it can feel like you're giving away a lot of power to the creatives. And, you know, if you've, if you've really put yourself out there and um, taken big risks and then your performance ever was not handled, you know, with the right care or, you know, um, that can, that in and of itself can feel really damaging to watch um, because, you know, you, you're giving your, you're giving your most sensitive aspects of yourself to someone. And then in the end, they're constructing it in, in an edit. And that's a lot of trust. And so I think that, you know, it can, it can feel bad when it feels like that wasn't, totally respected but apart from that it's just weird you know like i mean i'm sure that there's certain personality types that just glow and they thrive getting to watch it like yeah hell yeah there i am doing my thing and then there's like people who are just like naturally more critical and you know are gonna pick it apart and you know that's a natural part of the autistic process you know a lot the destruction that comes with the creation and there's a part of you that just wants to like, let it go and let it do its thing. And why do I need to be there to, you know, to beat up on myself? Just like that's other people's job. Is the, um, is the, I, to use your turn of phrase, beating up on yourself though, is there, is there stuff that can be learned as an actor from watching your own performance or can all those skills that be learned without actually witnessing a performance you've given? Can you see something and go, ah, I, I do that. I didn't realize I do do that. So I won't do that in future. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think that there's a lot that can be learned when you do watch yourself. Uh, I think it's important to deal with your, if your inner critic is a little too well-developed, if it's, if it's, if it has too many muscles on that monster, you know, it can be uh, really difficult to, to, um, for it to be beneficial. But if you're able to be really relaxed and compassionate with yourself um, when you're watching it, yeah, you'll notice that there are certain things that you do that um, even if it feels unusual um, or, you know, you were asking yourself in the moment, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. You'll watch it and you'll notice like, oh, that actually, it, it, as an audience member, that's not what's coming across. Like, there's something going on, but like, I'm... I'm actually believing that this person is existing in the moment. And so you start to develop a level of trust where um, you don't need to, there is a sort of X factor or a, a level of privacy, even when you are on camera, 
that can allow you to try different tricks and you know use different tactics to keep you in the moment even if the only thing that feels truthful is like i've lost i've completely lost the path i don't know what i'm doing here that's better than like just telling yourself some lie like oh i'm going after this objective and i'm doing this when it becomes a mental process it kind of falls apart it's better to live in a you know a more inhabited truth even if it feels like it's a little out of place in the scene so like you can learn things like that when you're watching yourself and um and I've been surprised by things that I thought were, and this happens a lot with auditions. I'll look back at a self tape and I'll think there's no way this is going to be any good. And I look at it, I'm like, I could actually see that, you know, in a film like that's, that works. So, um, and I know that Michael Caine would say that it's probably a yeah. good idea to, you know, there's a different, there's also a technical side of acting where when you hold your head in a certain way, or, you know, you're, you know, you must never blink. You know, there's there's that whole side of acting that you can always explore. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that's. I mean, I, I've watched that YouTube video. I see. I'm looking at you, and I'm not blinking. I'm not blinking. I'm looking at you, and I'm not moving my eyes, and I'm looking at you, and you see what it's doing. It's intimidating, and you're like, "What? This is crazy." <laughs> <laughs> so good. It's so good. Oh my god. Yeah, I love one of our favorite films is The Trip. And we just love, I don't know if you've seen that film, but um, the, the whole the whole Michael Caine um, dialect debate is probably one of the funniest scenes. <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely <laughs> worth a watch. It's hilarious. Oh, my God. Yeah. Steve Coogan and Rob Brydon trying to outdo each other with the Michael Caine impression. And you do end up picking a favorite and you're like, I think it's definitely Steve Coogan. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and when I get when it gets loud, it gets very loud indeed. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Uh, we, we we still need to find out, Graham, what your movie is that last brought you to tears. The performance that last brought you to tears. Huh. Well, the last performance that brought me to tears was actually uh, it was in a ninety nine seat theater in Venice in uh, in Los Angeles. Um, we were, we were exploring casting Shia LaBeouf in uh, one of our next projects, and um, he's in a mammoth play. Uh, I think it just closed, Henry Johnson. And um, I went to see him and plays this prisoner. And, I mean, he was just so... It was one of the best performances I've seen in years. Um, and he was just... It reminded me of... You know, he had this capacity to, like be present and in a way that felt like uh like he was listening with his blood he was like there was an animal in the room and um and there was such a short fuse like anything could happen and um yeah almost like you know tom hardy sometimes has that quality to him or marlon brando had that as well and um there was just a couple of moments in his in his performance where just how how vital he was and how how much he was listening and how open he was um it's just it's just got me and i know it's not a movie but that's the last time that i was brought to tears by performance um yeah I was i'm gonna really struck by that i'm gonna allow it i'm gonna allow it because it sounds quite an, like an incredible performance so that is a poster for bill nye's living going up on one side of the corridor and uh the david mamet play henry johnson did you say uh with shia labeouf brilliant Right, it's our final posters that are going up in the corridor before we leave and enter the auditorium itself. Our final posters depict, gentlemen, your unpopular movie opinions. Yeah, I mean, um, these what? are these are films that we we like despite being traditionally unpopular. It is a blank canvas to paint your own ideas on. But yes, that is often how people take it. People go with the, uh, the whole, uh, yeah, it's a movie I like that no one else likes or vice versa. I don't know that. I think people like this movie, but I think my opinion may be unpopular. But I think, you know, Tom Cruise clad in, you know, although he may, might look a little odd clad in, you know, ancient Japanese samurai armor. I do think he makes a convincing last samurai. And, uh, you know, I just... Again, I kind of, you know, a lot of what I love was brought up by, you know, my dad taking us to these, you know, big epic films, you know, Gladiator and Braveheart and Last Samurai, Kingdom of Heaven. And yeah, I just, you know, although I, you know, it's really Ken Watanabe who is the last samurai in the movie. Um, I think Tom Cruise, you know, makes it makes a damn good samurai. And uh, and I love that movie. 
absolutely love that movie. I think that scene where they have to bust him out, um, uh, Ken Watanabe, and he's gonna he's gonna off himself that night, and they decide to get him out so they can fight one last time. And the guy infiltrates the place with the bow and arrows. I think that's one of the coolest scenes, uh, action scenes ever done. It's so emotional, and I love that movie. So I'm a sucker for it. So this is this is 2003's. It was Ed Zwick uh, who directed it. It's uh, the Last Samurai, and uh, so I haven't seen it in a, in a while. He's an American soldier who gets captured in Japan and embraces samurai culture. So I, unsurprisingly. Um, and probably why he does make such a good samurai. I believe Tom Cruise trained, as he often does, for two years for the role in that movie, learning Japanese and learning how to use the sword. So I think he'll be very pleased to hear that he's convincing in that role. I mean, you, you just can tell. I mean, yeah, that, that doesn't surprise me, especially with him. But, you know, you can when an actor throws themselves into it, then you're really able to stay on them as opposed to, you know, use your stunt guys, which. Stunt guys are incredibly valuable and they're amazing. But even, you know, the best stunt guys will always encourage the actor to go in and try it themselves. And with Tom, I mean, he's doing everything himself. And, you know, back to our film, Aaron Eckhart, I mean, he did ev pretty much everything himself as well. And for, you know, for a director, that's just gold because it allows everything to be that much more emotional because you can stay on the face. You don't have to shoot over the back of the head. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Hats off to Tom and Aaron. You know, my my childhood room, which I'm feet away from, is filled with like Native American uh, artifacts and bow and arrows and the like. And his is filled with swords. So I'm just really happy that I wasn't around when he watched The Last Samurai for the first time. <laughs> uh, all right. So we've got one poster for The Last Samurai. Uh, Graham, what's your unpopular movie opinion? I don't know that it's it, all that unpopular, but um, my favorite Chris Nolan film is probably the prestige. And I think it's often overlooked. And I think that it was right, right at the sweet spot where, um, you know, the, uh, hit, <laughs> I guess we could call it his addiction to like, uh, the conceptual, um, and, and when he began and when he really, you know, and, and I love, I love his films. I think there's something, it's so incredible that he's able to tackle these giant concepts that generally have to do with time, you know, in such a, a tactile way. It's, it's gorgeous. And, and, you know, hats off to Zimmer for, you know, holding it all together. Um, but it really showed, um, and, you know, maybe I just, you know, there's something about my brother and I, I don't know where it comes from, but we really love stories about like, you know, brother like figures betraying each other. Uh, it's, it's in our first film. It's probably in both. I think it's in both of our next films. Um, but uh, you know, he's really, that was one of the last films where I felt like the characters really took, you know, downstage center in a way that was just so incredible. And it still had a lot of the, the great, you know, uh, tricks that he was, you know, he, he's been developing to kind of keep you guessing and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just so good. And the acting was just so incredible. And I just seeing um i mean hugh jackman and christian bale just as human beings and as actors and how they approach acting are so uh they're so different but there's parts of themselves that seem to really uh like there's just a slight overlap and i just i've totally bought into that um into that chemistry and that sort of repulsion and that admiration and that swirling around and david bowie as Nikola Tesla, like, that was just so badass. I didn't even know that it was David Bowie when I was watching it until, you know, when it first came out. And then afterwards, I learned that and blew my mind. Uh, yeah, this, it's a, an amazing movie. 2006 is The Prestige, these dueling magicians, as you say, Christine Bell and Hugh Jackman. So this is your favorite Christopher Nolan movie. What's next on the list? Because it was sandwiched between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. What's, what's number two and how big is the gap between The Prestige and the next Nolan movie that you consider at the number two spot? You know, I think... I just thought there was something really elegant about Interstellar. And, and it showed, I think, um, space in a way that felt uh less it, it it brought the heart into space in a way that i think hadn't really been done in it in that way like space has been approached 
as a sort of, you know, as this sort of void, cosmic metaphor um, that's, that's, you know, this, it's this big X factor and where it leads to never, we never really get, get to it. I mean, you know, contact, I guess, tried to do something mm. similar, but that's more, much more like high frequency sci-fi and a very, <laughs> a very different film. Um, this really yeah, dealt yeah. with family. And I think that, you know, the sort of the capacity of something like love to transcend um, the dimensions that we normally think in and, the, and to transcend um, the literal. And I just thought that that was so, that was so special to see. Okay, so it's a one-two for The Prestige and Interstellar, but The Prestige is very much your favorite movie. I'm putting up a poster for The Prestige on one side and The Last Samurai on the other side. As you're on Popular Movie Opinions, we've reached our last set of doors. So there is a queue of people waiting by these doors to join you, Richard Harris, and Philip Seymour Hoffman in the auditorium. Do you want to let them in or do you want it just the four of you? I, I don't want to let him in. <laughs> I think it's, I, I, I kind of want to be a little selfish this time and keep the theater to ourselves. But um, I don't know, Graham might want a buffer. Yeah, no, uh, normally I like the feeling of being in an audience. I think that's one of the biggest appeals of going to the cinema is sort of the collective experience. Uh, but given the company we have, I think I'm going to keep everyone, keep, keep the orcs at bay. <laughs> right we are not letting the crowd in they they amble off very understanding to go and watch something in another screening room i'll put on the last samurai for them i'm sure they're going to love that so they can go watch that while we go in here so we're going to play a few things on the big screen before we get to the movies you have picked for us tonight and the first thing we're going to play is the trailer for the film you are most looking forward to seeing at the cinema parker i'll start with you what are you most looking forward to seeing at the cinema we'll play the trailer um, I mean, it's going to be a tie between Killers of the Flower Moon and, of course, Rumble Through the Dark, because I am really excited for our film to come out. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see, you know, what Scorsese, you know, has done. Um, he, uh, yeah, I mean, he's one of the greats. I think he's, you know, I think him and Nolan and Bill and are probably the greatest living filmmakers right now, and Paul Thomas Anderson. And uh, yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait to see what he does and also that he's still doing it. I think that's so amazing that he, he loves his work so much. Um, he's still inspired to, to make these films and they're huge films and the amount of work that goes into it, I, I can't even fathom. Um, so, I mean, the guy's a rock star. Um, so my hat's off to him. Because, because I, I love the trailer for your movie as well. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to allow you both. We're going to play Rumble Through the Dark and Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm, I've try, I'm trying to avoid spoilers at the moment for Killers of the Flower Moon because I haven't seen it yet. And, and uh, because inevitably I'm on movie websites. Um, I, one did pop up the other day. It was an interview with uh, Rodrigo Prieto, who's uh, the cinematographer, I believe. And he was like, mm -hmm. the headline was just like, I was like, well, is that a spoiler? And what a weird headline. The headline was De Niro did actually spank Leonardo DiCaprio in that scene in Killers of the Flower Moon. Uh, and I was like, <laughs> that's, that's funny. You're, well, you're now you're going to have to see it. I mean, that, that's yeah. Right. What a great yeah, teaser. I mean, if, if, if I wasn't already sold, he really spanks him. OK, good. <laughs> uh, right. Let's kill us the Flower Moon and rumble through the dark. Uh, Graham. Uh, other than Rumble, which I'm, I'm really excited to see. I, I can't wait to sneak into a theater uh, and just, you know, for better or for worse, just be there with the crowd and, you know, be there while the story's being told. But um, yeah, Dune. I'm amped for Dune. I just... Uh, Dune. <laughs> yeah. Dune, Dune Part Two. Yeah. Is that, I remember there's that famous story of Steven Spielberg and Carl Gottlieb um, they always used to sneak into Jaws screenings at a specific moment to see uh, Ben Gardner's head pop out and watch the audience react. Do you have a moment in Rumble Through the Dark that you're really keen to see an audience's reaction to that you'll be sneaking in at the right time to check out? Oh, that's such a great question. Yeah, that's a really great question. For me, I think it would be um, there's, a, there's a fight that takes place in a truck that involves a knife that I'm I'm particularly proud of Graham and I for pulling off. Uh, 
because it because it, it was uh we, we had to deal with this cornfield and um and uh shooting <laughs> shooting a truck going through a cornfield if you're not on the budget of christopher nolan's kind of you know tough to pull off so we had to we kind of invented this thing you know you you, you shoot we shot what's <laughs> we, called we called it the corn veyor belt the corn veyor belt so you shoot <laughs> Four man's process, which is basically means that the car isn't moving, but you have lights around it that's simulating movement, so your actors can act within the car. But in order to simulate movement, usually it's easier if it's just, you know, you're on a dark night because the lights do everything for you. But the car was supposed to be traveling through this field of corn. So Graham actually came up with this idea with our special effects team of this corn veyor belt, which is basically just special effects guys spinning corn around against the window. So it simulated the cars going through corn. So like, although I think the sequence really is great, it's funny if you got the uh, bird's eye view of the process, it would kind of look like a Monty Python skit with the coconuts. You know, going, oh, so, my God. From, yeah. oh yeah. From Holy Grail. Yeah. That's amazing. Cause I, I, props to your special effects department because that scene is great and i would never have known that car wasn't actually traveling through that cornfield right yeah cool <laughs> i think for me uh, it's it's gotta be there's one punch that gets landed in the fight uh derek russo lands on aaron eckhart and yeah, I just between like the sound design and like where it is rhythmically in the fight, um, every time that I see it, I'm just you know I just go whoa! It just something about it. It seems like the biggest punch I've ever seen in my life, and um, and I would just love to see like just the heads bobbing and people just you know that surprise there if it if it registers with people the way that it that it you know impacted me. That's a hell of a punch. I'm really proud of that one. I, I think I, I think I certainly know the punch you mean. Um, obviously, you mentioned that Aaron Eckhart is uh, is in those scenes. He did so many of his own stunts. Uh, did any were, were there any injuries? Did any punches accidentally connect? Because obviously, Derek Russo, as I said, is a, a giant of a man. You know, uh, the only people that really got injured <laughs> were our uh, the, some of the great guys in our stunt department. Um, one of whom I think secretly we didn't realize this till after we were done shooting. Um, in the casino fight, uh, had his shoulder dislocated, and then and they went off for a second, then came back. We're like, "Is everything all right?" He's like, "Yeah, yeah, I'm all good, all good." And he continued to finish the the fight, and then we were having beers afterwards, and we're like, "So what happened? Like, you went over there with?" And he's like, "Yeah, I just." I had to put my shoulder back in. <laughs> like, no way. So these guys are no joke. I mean, they're just on a different, they're on a different level. And, you know, had we known, and probably the reason why he didn't tell us, is like, we would have stopped shooting. We would have sent him to the hospital. You know, we would have, we would have found another way to shoot the thing. But he's like, no, man, like, I, I'm good. I'm good. We're good. <laughs> I was like, you know, it's crazy. <laughs> I mean, legend. The stunt department are legends, and it's it's crazy that they're not recognised at the Academy Awards. I genuinely think that is a, that is an oversight, and you know the work they do and their commitment. And they're like, I'm I'll 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 put my goddamn shoulder back in to the socket rather than break filming. Is is just that's why they do what they do. But wow, um, all right, fantastic. So next up on the big screen, we are going to play the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. Probably when Gandalf uh, arrives with the elves um, in the two towers. Yeah, in the two towers when he starts just cascading down the hill. You know that soundtrack and that moment and just the light. Oh, he arrives with Rohan, right? No, no. I'm oh, oh, break. wait. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I knew it was the good guys because they has the blue light. <laughs> yeah, I know the moment you mean. Yeah, it's like you know, at dawn, look to the north. It's that. It's that bit where they come over the hilltop. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. um, I, 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 too, I flip flop on this all the time. Is it the battle for Minas Tirith or is it Helm's Deep that is the greatest battle? And I think more recently, I've settled on the moment you're talking about, which is the battle for Helm's Deep. I think that is the greatest battle in the saga. I love that sound design when uh, the guy says, and so it begins and it started to rain. You just hear the rain 
tink, tink, tink on the armor. Yes. So good. All right. That's, uh, the, that's the Riders of Rohan and Gandalf arriving in the Two Towers. And uh, what are we playing for you, Parker? Uh, mine's definitely from Gladiator. Uh, Russell Crowe comes out and he's told, you know, to start winning the crowd and be more of a showman. And so they're, they're staging a, you know, a, 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 they're staging a, a fight where they're supposed to be reenacting uh, the barbarian horde fighting the Roman soldiers and Russell Crowe and his fellow gladiators are leading the barbarian horde. And it's just that moment where he, you know, he steals the chariot and he jumps on the horse and he pulls out the sword and he starts twirling. And Hans Zimmer has that great music that comes in, which I think he actually redid, he reused for Pirates of the Caribbean. If you listen back, you can hear it. But it's just so good, and you have and you cut to Walking Phoenix, and he kind of starts twirling his fingers because even the Emperor's, you know, caught up in the showmanship. And I just think it's such a good moment, and uh, Russell Crowe's so good in that film. Ridley Scott, you know, just pulls off a masterpiece, and uh, yeah, I love that. It's funny. A side note on that: Graham and I were watching the DVD extras the other week, and did you know that Ridley Scott actually planned to have a rhino fight in the film? If you watch the extras for Gladiator, oh, there's bonkers. this, like, you know, it's it's funny, like, we were joking about the Eminem thing, like, directors sometimes have these kind of crazy ideas that sometimes aren't necessarily very good for the film. Ridley <laughs> had this storyboard of Russell Crowe fighting this giant rhino, and that was supposed to be in the film. With, with think, a, with a, like, he, he gets a cape, he gets like a, a cape. matador. Yeah, he's gonna and he's it. like, you know, and there was, it's all storyboarded, like, and he, you know, jumping on the, on the rhino, and there's even an animatronic test in the extras, where, like, they, they start doing, like, the basic rudimentary, like, what the rhinoceros would look like. It was it's totally crazy. crazy. Like, it totally would have, like, thrown you out of the film and, you know, not work, <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, that's why you throw paint at the wall, and hopefully the, the stuff that isn't good doesn't stick. Uh, 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 well, on that note of Gladiator, are you excited? Are you looking forward to? Are you apprehensive about Gladiator Two? Obviously, Ridley Scott's back. I think it's twenty twenty four. It comes out. Paul Mescal. Uh, I think it follows the story of the the nephew of Joaquin Phoenix's Commodus in the first movie, and it's his story. Are you excited for that? I I, I, I can't wait. I'm excited. I, I you know like Scorsese. I'm excited for anything you know Ridley Scott does, and I, I would say I'm more excited for Napoleon. Um, Mike. I mean, that looks epic, and no one's, you know, I think no one's, no one's tackled a Napoleon in a while, and uh, it's uh, it's a lot to pull off. But I'm just so happy he's the one to do it because sometimes you just you want someone to give you the goods, and uh, I think you know Ridley's Ridley's the guy to tell that story, you know, at least for me. Um, so I'm really excited about seeing that. I agree, but I gotta I gotta point out a pet peeve of mine that I I've, I've had for a while, which is when when the accent doesn't match where the people are from. Like, I'm like, how, like, the dialect of a, of a Frenchman is so unique. Um, mm. And how can we not have, you know, how, it, like, he's speaking with a standard American accent or something like that. And, and I had the same problem with Chernobyl, where I was like, I watched the series, and I'm like, why, is all, why are all these Russians speaking with a British accent? They're like, well, they're foreign, so they're speaking English, but we'll make them British. Mm. I'm like, no, like, Russian, they're Russian. So, like, you know, it, if you can't have them speak Russian, then like, you know, it is accent, kind of, it is kind of weird. It's like Britain's arch rival during World War II was the Nazis. But how many Nazi movies are speaking in the perfect King's English? You know, so it's kind of like I don't, you know, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I just I have a hard time with it, and I wish I I wish it I wish it didn't take me out of the story so much because there's so many incredible pieces of cinema and television that do this that i just i just like i really wish it you know i almost want to put on like the dubbed version you know from that country <laughs> and like get some subtitles on but that's that's a really interesting point isn't it because i will i i will choose subtitles over a dubbed version because i i i find the dubbing sometimes takes me out when you have you know a, a, like a, a, a the subtitle rather read and hear the dialect of the place in question than oh, I sorry. would have the dub version. Absolutely. Yeah, like imagine watching Old Boy or like a Miyazaki film, you know, with, with the dub. And actually, this is funny. In, uh, it's either Spirited of, No, Howl's Moving Castle. I was introducing mm -hmm. someone to uh, Howl's Moving Castle, um, and they watched it. And they liked it, and they and then I realized they watched like the standard thing that a lot of people do is they watch it dubbed. Um, and the cast it was like Meryl Streep and Christian Bale and like all these people, but like none of I started watching it, 
none of the humor and what makes it work, like for the space, you know, the vernacular of the space, like none of it really comes across because there's that sort of, you know, uh, like th kabuki theatricality that comes with, you know, a lot of these characters. And it just doesn't, it's, if you're speaking English, you can't really, you can't do it. And, and you're certainly not allowed to try. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, but and I think I think I, the 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 delivery of a line, even if you do not understand the language, has a certain inflection and intonation that is key to the performance. You are separating part of that actor's performance out yeah. of what you're watching on screen. Have, have you ever seen a performance of your own uh, dubbed ever? What was it, uh, on screen? Uh, yeah, yeah, I've watched a couple episodes of The Good Wife and Sherman. Um, you know. I've... <laughs> I don't know. It was a weird experience. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's crack on to the next thing we're playing on the screen, which is what you gentlemen consider cinema's most shocking moment. Yeah, I for me, it's um, I, I, I love the untouch. I still love the untouchables, um, the film. And I love, you know, I think that's really brilliantly cast and it's such a good such a good gangster film and uh yeah sean connery you know plays a beat cop on that and his death in the movie is just really really shocking and um you just feel for him because he stay the way the camera stays with him, with him in the throes and he's um you know uh graham and i are working on something right now titled do not go gentle and he's he's certainly not going gentle and uh it's hard to watch because he's such a beloved actor and uh uh, yeah, he, he, you know, it's one of his one of his later roles, but I think I think he does a great job, and that that always sticks with me. Yeah, of course. I mean, I know. I mean, I think he does a great job as well. He won he won his only Oscar Best Supporting Actor for 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 that role, and um, and yeah, it's the fake out, isn't it? And because it's De Palma, so you've got that POV shot following around the the apartment for a bit, and then obviously you think he's scared off the assassin, and then bang frank nitty's across the road so you think he's won you're yep. like this guy knows what he's doing he's tough like he knows yep. he, he gets it and then wow yep yeah it's shocking right so we're playing uh malone sean connery's death that's one scene we're playing for the most shocking moment graham i think it's hard to beat chan wook's old boy twist and for anyone who hasn't seen it you know you can't you don't really want to give it away but um you know, I think that 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 twist at the end and that redefinition of like all the relationships and turning it completely on its head and just like playing with the deeply rooted psychological disgust of what this guy's realizing. It's just, yeah, I mean, that blew my mind. You just, you just don't see it coming at all, you know? Yeah, yeah. And I think you're absolutely right not to spoil it because it's, it's one of those, like, I, the reason you picked it, it's truly one of cinema's most shocking moments, you know. This yeah. guy, he's imprisoned in a room for 15 years, comes out, tries to work out what's going on, why this happened, who did it to him, and you're on this journey and you just don't expect that rug pull at the end. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, if you haven't seen it, you got to check it out because it's also got some of the, it's one of the, we watched a lot of fighting movies, as you can imagine to prep for rumble and that was uh that was one of them that hallway fight it's just oh, you know so good incredible yeah absolutely great recommendation if no one's seen uh park chan wook's 2003 masterpiece old boy do check it out right next thing through the dolby atmos speakers we're going to play the line or piece of dialogue from a movie that most affected you yeah well i'm not i mean i gonna do it in my famous william wallace accent oh come uh, on but i def definitely definitely <laughs> do it do it do it do it <laughs> <laughs> definitely the line from braveheart every man dies not every man really lives um which i think they you know was the tagline for the film they ended up choosing um and uh yeah i like that one that sticks with me yeah yeah it's a it's a great moment that's it that's at the end after he's being captured and all the rest of it. And um, I think Mel Gibson's come out now and gone, yeah, it might not all be true, um, but it was done for dramatic effects because there was that huge furore at the time of like, they've rewritten history. This isn't how it happened, but it was done as it often is to make a movie better. I, I have no issue with that, really. I, I, you know, yeah, I, I think saying, if yeah, you... I went... Yeah. 
I, I, was say, I went to Scotland this summer and, you know, I went to like Sterling and stuff. And so I saw it was interesting because I was thinking like, okay, if I had directed this, you know, like Sterling, the Battle of Sterling was really like a bridge battle, you know, and it was about occupying this bridge. And it just would have cinematically, it would have, um, it would have been tougher to pull off. I'm not saying you couldn't have done it, but it would have been a different film. So like a lot of the decisions I can understand and I can also understand, you know, you know, especially, you know, Scottish people being frustrated with it where, you know, uh, eight-year-old American child doesn't, you know, uh, he falls in love with it because, you know, it's the first time you've been seeing any of this. So, you know, I, I totally get both sides. And at the end of the day, there's always going to be some creative license. Um, and, you know, people will have their opinion and they're, they're, they're welcome to it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a, there's a funny story where one of the Scottish extras uh, on the film uh, when they were filming the Battle of Sterling, uh, said to Mel Gibson, uh, "Went, uh, wait, why, uh, why are you, uh, why are you filming it here without a bridge?" And Mel Gibson went, oh, "Yeah, well, the bridge got in the way." <laughs> and the Scottish actually went, "That's what the English discovered as well." <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I never heard that. That's brilliant. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, lovely stuff. Um, and how about your line, Graham? Um. What well, comes to mind is uh, in Dead Poets, Robin Williams' line about, you know, we don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we're members of the human race. And, you know, all the bits about how engineering, doctors, all this stuff, like it helps us keep life going. But, um, you know, art is what reminds us, you know, what we stay alive for. And just as an artist, I think that, um, yeah, it, it hit even when I was really young. I really like that. Yeah, yeah, that's a it's a it's a beautiful moment in a beautiful film. I love Dead Poet Society. Um, great stuff. Two wonderful quotes. Do you know where we are? We're on the penultimate question before you declare the movies you have picked to screen tonight. And our final thing to play through the speakers in this auditorium is what you consider the best use of music in a movie. Yeah, I, I think I'll I'll jump on one of my brother's favorites for this. I, I think the uh the Hans Zimmer score when they're escaping from the water plane at Interstellar is uh is pretty awesome. Uh along with McConaughey's line of docking. Um <laughs> which is so cool. It's just a great, you know, there's a lot of there's moments in films that I'll like like I put on Last of the Mohicans last night just to, you know, watch one of the sequences because I think the music's so brilliant in that and I I I, Can um, I guess which one it was? Was it the yeah, sure. scene at the end where Daniel Day Lewis is running along the cliff face, uh, trying to save his his brothers? Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. Yep. And yeah. I and that was and that was another one my dad took us to, and I think that he always like he always has the hypothetical. Okay, if we all had to pick a weapon, what would it be? And he always picks what the dad has in that, which is like this, you know, like battle axe rifle thing, which he's like able to shoot and throw. It's incredible. But like, yeah, the uh, that movie's yeah beautiful. The score is just. I think that score was actually written by two different people in Last of the Mohicans because one of the guys died, which makes it even more incredible. That so you don't really see a collaboration much in that department. But yeah, getting back to my answer, yeah, Inter Interstellar. Um, the water planet sequence is pretty awesome. I, I, again, I, weirdly, I, that's a sequence I will rewatch. I just think the whole the whole journey of it, Hans Zimmer's score, the fact that Christopher Nolan didn't tell him, didn't show him the movie to do the score, just went, uh, just went. Uh, he he gave him a, a piece of paper with a story about a father leaving their daughter to go to work, and that was that was Hans Zimmer's like. Like the catalyst for his score but yeah that bit where they get back to the spaceship and so much time has passed is such a great button on that scene mm, yep yep uh, right then graham what is yours what is your best use of music in a movie we've got interstellar hans zimmer scores fading out it's time to segue into yours seamlessly gosh it's it's so hard because music makes cinema cinema you know parker and i were talking about you know, the fine line between when something is epic and cheesy, it's like really the difference is, or cliche, it just comes down to execution. And like, you know, what makes docking work in Interstellar is the what comes immediately after he says docking. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, just, yeah. It, it, it holds up these moments mm -hmm. where we go, oh, it's part of the, it's part of the hero's journey. You know, there's something archetypal about it. And it, it, 
becomes impossible to scoff at unless you have no heart. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, like jo John Barry's um, the score for Out of Africa, I think, is you know just takes you to uh, it's pr probably one of those like heart opening pieces I've I've really ever heard. Um, but, uh, you know, and it sort of, it flies. I mean, there's sort of the, the whole history of flight around Africa, you know, cause the, the roads never really, the whole road thing never really worked out in the bush. Um, and it just, there's a sense of flight to it. That's really special. And similarly, and I think this probably more specifically is what I would be my answer. I, I think that the, the opening title sequence of a new hope, I think it's hard to beat that. Like that, that just set up the entire you know, the entire journey and um, in such a way that I just, I don't think that the series would have been, you know, what it is without that. Yeah. That opening yeah. Call. Yeah. Uh, that, 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 a moment for a certain generation, including myself, that was the first time we ever heard John Williams score and we're just like, what is happening? What is this? I, w w this is something new. This I've not experienced this. It's, it's amazing. Great stuff. I love, I love these choices. So we've got Hans Zimmer's score from Interstellar and John Williams' score from Star Wars, A New Hope. And here we are. We have arrived at the end of our journey. It's time to announce to Philip Seymour Hoffman, Richard Harris, and indeed each other, the double bill of movies that you have selected for us to play tonight. I'll start with you, Parker. What? Are we watching? Well, this is kind of playing into, you know, my triple threat thespian I'm bringing uh, to the theater. And it's also the first film I ever saw. I saw it with my grandmother and I watched it over and over and over growing up when I was very young and I still love it. Um, but Pirates of Penzance uh, starring Kevin Kline. I, I mean, I still love that movie. I think Kevin Kline is one of the greatest, you know, actors. His comedic timing is absolutely brilliant. He's amazing in Fish Called Wanda. I mean, he's he's even he's he's even funny in Sophie's Choice before the movie becomes not funny, of course, at all. The guy can't. I mean, the guy is just the guy is brilliant. He's so full of life. Um, but yeah, him and Pirates of Penzance. Probably not a lot of people in my generation have seen it, so I recommend watching it. But I bet Richard Harris would smile when I put that on. Um, so for for the uninitiated what 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 lies in store for them when they watch 1983's the pirates of penzance what what kind of journey are they about to go on i mean alex the production budget is not going to be that of johnny depp you know um in his pirate series but you know you're going to have a lot of painted backdrops um but still you know kevin klein plays a great swashbuckling pirate and it's it's a you know it's a musical it was an opera um, and then they decide to make a movie version and uh, Angela Lansbury's in it. Um, and it's about these orphaned pirates, you know, who's been who've been traveling the seas. And they're although they they want to be very menacing and dangerous. They all are actually, you know, very damaged souls because they've all been abandoned as children and they banded together as these orphans. And it's very uh, it's very funny. It's a quick watch. Um, and uh, I think it. It's just it's one of those things that kind of I think it stands the it stands the test of time because no, no one else is ever going to make a movie like that again. Um, and uh, so, yeah, yeah, I, I recommend it. And I think you're right. I think you mentioned very few people for have 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 seen it. I think it was despite great reviews, uh, it was a bit of a flop at the time because and how's it how's this for a model that would resurface a few years uh, ago? Um, they decided to release it on uh, TV at the same time they decided to release it in theatres. And so all the exhibitors went, right, well, we're not happy. And so they didn't show it in the theatres. Takes, wow. takes you back to literally 2019, doesn't it? Amazing, amazing. Now our full circle are doing it all over again. <laughs> right, we have one movie. Let's complete our double bill. Graham, what is the second movie we are watching? Well, I was I was gonna say Killers of the Flower Moon, but Parker, are you are you getting extra invite? Is, is Peter O'Toole coming? Oh, we, we're gonna invite him, sure. Yeah, if he's coming, and I think I think I might have to do a rewatch of Lawrence of Arabia. Oof. Yeah, 
Yeah, I would love to see that. You do like the seventy millimeter print. Uh huh. Yeah, that'd be cool. I, I, we would appreciate that. I've never seen it in a in a cinema before. You know, I we've only seen it on our on our TV. So that would be. I think I might have to switch to Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia. Answer. I mean, that's just. It's just such. It's just such a gorgeous tapestry, and um, I mean, yeah, talk about the the soundtrack too, and just the. Uh, you know, I, they just don't really make they don't really make films like that anymore. No, no, they don't. It's a, it is a, truly a, an incredible film, and um, Omar Sharif is is so good in that as well. Yeah, and I think I think they that was really Peter O'Toole's discovery. I mean, you can imagine getting cast in that, and then you're just part of this epic, epic film. I mean, that's yeah, that was like part of it. That what put him on the map? Oh yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, they, that's another thing that they you don't really have happen anymore. You don't have like the studio system that says, "Hey, you kid, they're gonna be in the big picture," and then right. they, you know, and they put the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars behind you and sort of make a star. You know, like Clint Eastwood, I guess, was the last real. You know, hey, you, we're gonna make, we're gonna put you through the studio system, and you're gonna, you're gonna be famous, and you're gonna be a star. Yep. Yeah. Wow. I'm going to roll the dice on this. I'm assuming, uh, based on a pattern that has emerged, uh, Lawrence of Arabia was a, another film you were shown by your dad because we've got The Last Samurai, Braveheart, and Last of the Mohicans. Lawrence of Arabia definitely fits the mold of huge military historical epic. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure you could guess the rest too. But um, yeah, it was. He, he definitely was an influence as far as that. And I think that, you know, I think that Gra Graham and I definitely, you can kind of tell from rumble where it goes in the end you know kind of at, hopefully to that epic level you know one day we hope to champion you know those types of films you know with big sets and big cast and you know um major movements and uh yeah that's you know that's partly why i think we're so excited to see dune 2 and napoleon i mean when our when our mom would read us bedtime stories you know it'd be like nursery rhyme kind of stuff and you know the normal the normal slew um but whenever we had, you know, the rare reading from our father, it was, I'm sure if you can, under, you can probably guess what is on his bedside table, but what he would end up reading to us is just like, you know, epic history battles, you know, Alexander the Great, you know, the stories of Napoleon, or, you know, if there was any fiction, it was, you know, it was a book of Greek and Roman myths, you know, it was all, it was so big and the stakes were so high. Um, that I think it did influence, um, you know, what we've been drawn to in the film, for sure. I mean, I, 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 to go back to your own movie, Rumble Through the Dark, I, there is a, there is an epic quality, despite the intimacy of the story and it, about this one man. There's it, certainly his journey feels quite epic, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I would never spoil it for anyone because I would suggest everyone goes and sees this, that final fight, and this is a testament to your filmmaking. I genuinely had no idea which way it was going to go. And I love that because normally you can predict an outcome to a film. And I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I honestly, I, I, I wasn't sure. And that's all I'll say because I'm starting to err on giving too much away. But well done. Mm, thank you. Thank wow. you. That's thank a you. great compliment. We really appreciate that. Wow. Right then. The curtains have closed. The four of you are milling out, smiling, chatting and thanking each other for taking each other on an epic night out at the cinema. But before you go, it's time, as always, for this week's mystery question as we ask, what's in the box? So I'm seeing this question for the first time. OK, OK. As directing siblings, what is the biggest argument you've ever had while making a movie and how did you sort it out? Holy that was a random question you pulled? Yep. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, well, yeah, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, we had, in our la in, the, in Rumble, we had, probably what was our biggest argument was, um, <laughs> we were, we were trying to figure out, like, how how best to work with each other when when basically like we have no time you know and i'm the, i'm generally like the idealist of the group i i'm overly optimistic about like what we can what we can get in a certain amount of time and you know i, I know that there's an idealist in parker that dreams and wants to do other things but he's also the one who at the end of the day 
as the big brother, knows that the most important thing is that we actually make a freaking day. Because if you don't, <laughs> then, then you don't actually have the film in the can. And it was just, you know, it was damn near coming to blows. Although what was funny is that right after this argument, our key grip, Cobra came up to us and he goes, man, I got to say, you know, a lot of this crew has worked with, uh, with directing partners and directing duos before, and we generally don't do it because it's just, it's just chaos normally, uh, which I, I had never heard before. He's like, you know, you just, you got, you got things being pulled in every direction and there's not really a sense of cohesion and cent central authority. And I just got to say, like, you guys have been handling this so well. And, and I, and you know, there's been no like hint of dissension between the two of you. And that's just, you know, everyone feels it. See, this and is I'm the ventriloquist voice that I was telling you about. <laughs> and you I couldn't believe it. I was literally, I saw him, I was storming like off of set. I, ba I basically told Parker, like you direct this scene. Like I need to go for a freaking walk. And like he just happened to like divine providence, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said that to me, and I was like livid, like I was feeling my blood just boiling because I just I felt like I had for the first time when we were working together, I felt like I had no place. I was like, what am I, what am I bringing if I can't even if I don't have the time to do this thing? Like he can do it on his own. Why am I doing this? And anyways, what was funny is that what ended up bringing it all back together is our cinematographer. Like before we had even worked on this film kind of as a joke but kind of you know as his way of like an offering for synergistic improvement he um he bought us a, a session with this guy that he used to work with when he was he was really young um who now does horse therapy with his wife and so he got me parker and him to go meet with like this equine therapist in the middle of like Monterey County. And, you know, he's this older like therapist with his wife. And we're just like, what the hell are we doing here with these like, with this horse? And he's like, go brush the horse. And like, what did you notice about your brother for cleaning the horse? And I'm like, I don't know. Like, he's a sensitive soul. Like, <laughs> so, anyways, we sort of, uh, you know, we, we brought it back to, uh, we brought the horse back in metaphorically after that argument. And, uh, Things have never been better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. When I asked that question, I, I, we could have been here a year and horse therapy would never have been an answer I would have expected. Well done. Well done. <laughs> That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Uh, right, then. That is it, gentlemen. The taxi has arrived to ferry you back to reality. But before you go, let's recap your perfect trip to the movies you are going with philip seymour hoffman and richard harris you are going after drinks in the evening which may or may not be a good idea you uh, are sitting in the middle uh parker well uh, no grab you're sitting in the middle parker you've done the right thing and separated yourself and richard harris putting yourselves at the back of the movie i say you've done a good thing the snacks you're getting may involve milk duds which could turn into projectiles you are having to drink a large coke and something in a secret flask uh graham you are having a dr pepper and you are having popcorn with milk duds in we won't get into who created the milk duds popcorn combination we're walking down the corridor the posters we're putting up for your fondest movie memory both are for braveheart your worst movie memory yours is from braveheart graham parker yours is from watching eight mile it was your first day and it was the end of that very brief relationship the last performance that brought you to tears the posters we're putting up First of all, we're putting up for you, Graham, a poster for the David Mamet play Henry Johnson, in which you saw Shia LaBeouf, uh, whereas for you, Bill Nighy Parker in Living, and the final poster depicts your unpopular movie opinions. I'm going to give these unpopular movie opinions out of one to five. A three, I don't think they're the most unpopular in the world, but they are fascinating. Graham, yours is. The Prestige is Christopher Nolan's greatest movie, whereas Parker, yours is... Uh, maybe yours is a four. Tom Cruise makes a convincing Last Samurai. We're playing the trailer for your movie, a Rumble in the Dark, as well as Killers of the Flower Moon. It's the movies you're most looking forward to seeing at the cinema. 
the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. It is Gandalf arriving with the Riders of Rowan for you, Graham, for the Battle of Helm's Deep in the Two Towers, whereas yours is when Russell Crowe in, in Gladiator as Maximus starts showing off for the crowd. The moment that you consider cinema's most shocking, Graham, it is old boy for you. Parker, it's Connery's death in The Untouchables. The line of dialogue that most affected you. Yours is Robin Williams' speech in the middle of the Dead Poets Society. Parker, yours is every man dies. Not every man really lives, obviously, from Braveheart. The best use of music in a movie. Parker, yours is Hans Zimmer's score. From the escape from the water planet in Interstellar. Graham, yours is the opening crawl of Star Wars. A new hope before we watch the incredible Double Bill. This bub, a double bill that will absolutely probably never exist in the real world. The Pirates of Penzance, followed by Lawrence of Arabia. Gentlemen, it, it's, it has been an absolute pleasure. Once again, let me end as I began. Congratulations on Rumble Through the Dark. But have you enjoyed your trip to the movies? Absolutely. Yeah. Alex, thank you so much. This is such a this is such a pleasure. Yeah, what a uh, treat. That was really fun. <laughs> thank you so much for watching this interview. Um I'd love it if you would check out some of the other interviews on our channel. They're all fascinating and unique trips to the movies with some wonderful, wonderful guests. And if you would like to find out more, do hit us up on our social channels. We are at Trip to Movies Pod. That's at Trip to Movies Pod on all social media with lovely content on there. And you can get in touch with us if you so wish. Thanks again.